Hello, everyone. I am John Coleman from Apocalypsis, an institute for the humanities, an alternative college and high school here on New Milford, Connecticut, USA. This is episode 137 of A Conversation With. Before I introduce our guest, one announcement about our great website, apoxtostasisinstitute.wordpress.com. You can find that down below. And that is an invitation to click on our courses and staff page. And should you do that, you'll see our featured course this month of recording as we speak about Christian history and ideas taught by our own Professor David Rios and all of the other classes that the various staff at our dear college teach. We're always adding and adjusting this list. And what you'll find at Apocalypse Stacy's is not just a critique of education, but actually people that are working to address those weaknesses. A lot of people have the critique. Very few people are doing anything about it. But here at Apocalypse Stacy's Institute, we are. And you can find out about our work by clicking in that courses and staff tab and enrolling in a class. All right. So this episode 137 is with singer-songwriter David Rovix. Now, David has been a frequent guest on this podcast, especially before the pandemic, a pandemic, as you'll find out in our conversation, which had great consequences for those in the musical world and the independent musical world, such as David. We had not really spoken uh, for about two years on camera, and so it was great to pick David's mind on a few different points, as you'll find out, especially about some of these political categories that the media gives us. David's site will also be down below in the description. You can see his own podcast, his songbook, his media, his work with folk music, and so forth. Lastly, in that happy description below, you'll be able to find all of the conversations between David and myself over the past several years. David, in fact, during the anniversary of the end of the First World War in 2018, did a special program at Apocalypse de Stasis where he played music in Danbury at a place we'd rented for the evening. He played music and did a fine job of it. And you can see that great concert hosted by Apocalypse Stasis. You can see the recording of that also down below. And so without further ado, here's my talk 137 with David Rovix. All right. Well, welcome back, David. It's been about uh, 25, 26 months since we spoke, according to the uh, the YouTube upload uh, calendar there. We spoke in June of 2020 about the rent strike. And for the audience, I'm going to put down all of our previous discussions between you and I and also with Paula DeAngelis on a few uh, folk music shows we've done. What have you been doing in the past uh, two years and change, David? <laughs> That's great. That's funny that it's been that long because I guess me and you and Paula exchange enough messages that I, I, I feel like I'm regularly in touch anyway. But um, ah, what's been going on? Let's see. So that's been now two, a little more than two years. So it, it's been a fairly eventful couple of years despite uh, the um, sort of uneventfulness of the eventfulness. I mean, you know, people have been stuck at home a lot and uh, a lot of people having a very uh, sort of isolating and lonely and other kinds of awful experiences uh, with with the pandemic, uh, death, uh, of course, you know, unemployment, uh, whatever else. Um, for me, it's been uh, a little of that, uh, you know, a, a little of uh, the uh, sort of unemployment friends dying and, um, you know, not being able to tour, but also a period of a lot of uh, 
social unrest that I've been sort of uh, participating in, I suppose you could say, <laughs> in various forms, and then also um, I would say uh, sort of a lot of a lot of other developments I think have been going on in terms of uh, the the left uh, as it as it as it may be called, and um, the uh, various forces in the world that want to uh, destroy whatever's left of the left and <laughs> the fascists and the, the liberals and the capitalists. There's been a lot going on, I'd say, basically. And hard, to, hard to even know where to begin. <laughs> right. Well, I'm sure we'll get into a whole bunch of, uh, of, of those uh, developments as we get along, but maybe uh, you can tell us, David, what uh, projects you've been working on. When we spoke last, you were just getting your steam up for the interview series, and uh, indeed you were involved in the rent strike. So what are some um, political and also artistic projects that you've been chipping away at? Yeah, I've been, um, I, I, I've been involved with uh, tenant uh, organizing in, in various uh, capacities uh, for many years, and, and including over the past couple of years, and, and setting up this uh, initiative, the uh, Portland Emergency Eviction Response Network, which in, in effect is just one of many small networks of, uh, of uh, people that are uh, interested in or otherwise involved with um, eviction defense or uh, direct action related to uh, evictions. So it, which is around here, largely a theoretical idea and a, a nascent idea, but which has been applied uh, with great success on occasion, such as uh, at the Red House in Mississippi, uh, the, the Mississippi neighborhood of North Portland, um, where there was an eviction uh, uh, prevented uh, through lots of popular participation and um, yeah that's uh, so yeah that's that's and then artistically I mean the pandemic uh, the, the uh, unemployment pandemic unemployment assistance was uh, the best uh, arts promotion uh, program that I've ever been uh, you know part of <laughs> unintentionally I mean they veritably showered the working class in this country with money if you were uh, especially if you were a member of the working class that is uh, literate uh, very very patient uh, connected to the internet willing to spend ridiculous amounts of time on hold and you have several children i mean that combination is fantastic so for those of us who are persistent enough to wait seven months to get the checks in the mail after seven months of being on hold every day and, on, and and getting busy, busy signals every day. Finally, you know, getting the checks. I mean, it was amazing. And um, and I recorded four albums. Some of uh, you know, two of which were quite costly and far beyond the budget that I would ever normally be able to have in the post merch era, in the post twenty thirteen Spotify era. Uh, after you know the point at which budgets collapsed for recording projects for me and millions of others. But uh, yeah, the pandemic was good for the arts uh, as far as as far as, you know, being able to record and productivity. Um, it was problematic in terms of actually getting together with other musicians physically. But luckily, um, these days, that's uh, a problem that can be uh, uh, sort of gotten around in various ways. But and there were still also musicians uh, willing to expose themselves to the recording studios, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Although I did have, you know, the experience of musicians backing out, you know, at the last minute, which never happens. Musicians are usually the most reliable and on time and hardworking of workers you will ever encounter. Although most people don't even realize that musicians are workers, but they are and they work their asses off and they're very reliable and, and they show up on time. And it's they're nothing like uh, what people imagine, you know, musicians to be like, you know, occasionally. But, you know, there, there has to be the exception to prove the rule, you know. I've recorded with musicians who got too drunk to function and, you know, but it's very rare. It's very rare. They're very hard work and bunch, but it did happen that I uh, had a musician uh, cancel on me because their, their wife, um, you know, didn't want them to get COVID and at the studio, you know, which was perfectly reasonable reason to, can uh, you know, although, you know, I thought we had kind of worked that out beforehand that we, <laughs> we're going to wear masks unless we're singing and, you know, otherwise hope for the best, but, you know, yeah. And how has the, uh, in this uh, uh, post-merch world, um, how has the touring um, for, for um, 
for gigs and so forth. How has that rebounded? Has it rebounded? Um, are there any lingering, um, let's say, economical effects of COVID in terms of audience and so forth, David? I would say that um, it, it went through phases. Um, I mean, there was the phase at the end of, um, like, I guess just before the Delta variant um, became dominant, uh, when it was looking like uh, the, the vaccine and, and stuff was going to end up being able to, you know, allowing a lot of the societies to safely open up a lot sooner. So it was like early summer 2021 that um, Scandinavia was generally opening opening up in, in, and uh, and that was uh, I toured Scandinavia at a time when it was probably the only place in the world you could do a tour at that time where things seemed totally back to normal basically and I did I did tours in Scandinavia just in that little window and, and that, that sort of pre Delta or sort of when Delta was taking hold before Omicron but then when Omicron came, that shut everything down again. But now um, we're now just getting to the point, at, at, from my experience, where um, booking a tour in Scandinavia, which I'm doing in October, is uh, seeming to be going like it used to go pre-2020 in terms of the response I'm getting. So that, I mean, that's just early indications are telling me that things are just now getting back to normal to some extent, but definitely not back to normal because um, there's still an element, a significant element of the population that is scared to go, uh, you know, for very understandable reasons, scared to go inside and, and uh, you know, scared of all the maskless uh, people everywhere, you know, of which I am one. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, that's uh, definitely, it's, it's not, it's not, going back to normal but it's the close it's closer to normal than it's been since the pandemic hit and and I, and it's at a point where it seems i can actually tour without losing money probably starting in october in scandinavia but uh, touring in britain and touring elsewhere uh, prior uh, to just very recently has been not at all like it used to be it's still not normal. And also, I'm not sure if it's going to go back to normal because one of the things that's been happening along with the pandemic, particularly in the U.S. and the U.K., is uh, the um, the rise of the landlord class and the, the shrinking of venues and, the you know, everything's becoming more expensive in terms of uh, commercial uh, and uh, residential everything in terms of real estate, people living anywhere, venues, the venues are shrinking. Half the pubs in England have closed in the past 10 years and, you know, they're not being replaced with other m music venues. You know, they're being replaced with other kinds of places and uh, it's just been terrible for uh, live music. But also in the U.S., uh, that's even more been the case and particularly since Spotify and, 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 you know, started their free tier in 2013 and the bottom fell out of merch sales, CD sales for musicians around the world. I mean, that's been a complete disaster, uh, f especially in countries like the U.S. and the U.K. where, where uh, you know, for performers, probably you know, like half their income was coming from merch sales and it's... Uh, that, so then when that's gone, that's gone. It's a big deal. You know, and for some people, they can do well with T-shirts and whatever. But for most of us, I think if they weren't, they're not, if they're not buying your CDs, they're not buying much of anything, you know. So they couldn't hardly afford all those CDs before anyway. But now they just, uh, you know, don't need to buy them. Yeah, and I think also on top of the um, the, the slings and arrows of touring, there's also the the price rises and and this thing to uh to consider with with um you know the bottom line of going out there and, and and hustling there yeah like just in recent months the the rise in the cost of fuel and particularly the rise in plane tickets and the rise in the cost of renting a car has made um touring like i used to tour that much more impossible i mean even if i were getting as many gigs as i was getting prior to 2020 that made it because it's even prior to 2020 like doing doing a tour in europe i'd be spending about half of what i was making i mean it's very expensive touring is very expensive and so you end up uh you spend a lot of money when you travel and you know if you're if you're 
fl flying and renting cars and you know you're not hitchhiking you know um and uh and then so you have to make a lot of money you know and then if you don't make a lot of money you know you, know, you might you, you might break even or you might you know that that sort of thing but but uh that was that now you know with with uh, renting a car or buying a plane ticket costing two three four times what it used to cost uh, that makes uh, you know that form those forms of travel either impossible or you know requiring a, a whole lot of good gigs to to cover the cost. So it's uh, yeah, it's at a real uh, it's it's some kind of a transition point of some kind. I don't know. I mean, I wrote a essay recent. I guess more, one of the more recent pieces I published in Counterpunch is actually they got rid of the subtitle for but it was uh, the subtitle is we're all crust punks now which is um which is the uh, basically i mean you know people who used to tour and uh stay in hotels and rent cars and and fly uh, in planes i mean that's now all changing for a lot of people if they can tour at all then they're doing it by you know taking buses and trains and uh, you know, and they're sleeping on people's couches. You know, that's the kind of reality for a lot of musicians that uh, you you know were able to afford much nicer ways of you know, traveling only a few years ago. I'm sure that for a lot of musicians, they're not making the transition to buses and couches. They're just not touring. That's increasingly. I mean, that's been the case for many many years. That the the numbers of professional musicians out there who claim to be professional musicians on their tax forms are d rapidly decreasing. Just the overall numbers are just decreasing because people just can't afford to do it anymore. And those who can afford to do it are increasingly, you know, people who were born with money or inherited a home that they live in from their parents or, you know, any number of other things that makes their expenses, their overhead a lot lower so they can afford to do it. And so that means just because of the way things work with this country and the way things are in this country, that the ranks of the number of people who are employed as musicians uh, not only are decreasing, but they're becoming more and more male and more and more white over time. And then there's the aspect more of a longer burn, but maybe it'll it, it'll be um, showing up sooner than later. But there's also um, because of COVID nineteen, because of of um, uh, these these other health uh, things that are that are um, in the media and so forth. Uh, it seems, and this has been a trend. People have been noticing this for for decades now. But you know, distinctly, people are less inclined to do things like go out. They're less inclined to go out to clubs and so forth. And this again uh, had been going on. There was a, a book you might recall, uh, "Bowling Alone," from maybe twenty years ago. "Bowling Alone," that that was all on this very topic. But there's also that aspect too. These social changes that you're intimating. So it's it's a tough road to hoe that you're you're in. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think it, it's there are so many other ways for people to to uh, entertain themselves than from going out, you know, than going out at, to hear a live uh, performer. So that's that's certainly uh, yeah for anybody involved with that kind of work, live performance, uh, that is certainly uh, the case. Although I think there's always um, maybe not always, but there there is so far there's always a certain significant subset of people that are always into the live experience and i think that also makes sense that this isn't going to just uh, go away at least in the foreseeable future because uh just of the basic reality that we have bodies we are physical people and and we want to be together with other people in physical spaces it's, and so far um the virtual reality has not even nearly gotten to the point where it uh, has replaced such desires for a significant number of people it may, perhaps it's, it's worked for some of us it certainly has never worked for me or for a lot of other people you know people want to get out and the pandemic has has definitely illustrated that that people want each other's company or at least a significant number of people do want that but but in terms of the sort of uh, if if you lose half your audience because half your audience is uh, generally more inclined to stay home and watch a movie or or you know look at their phones or you know whatever they're doing other than going out 
Yeah, that that's a lot of people to lose, you know. And and if you were only getting twenty people coming to your shows, and that was uh, you know enough, but barely enough, then the difference between getting twenty people coming to your show in Toledo and getting ten people coming to your show in Toledo will make the difference between making a living and not making a living for a lot of people. Indeed, indeed. So, David, I was gonna. I thought it would be a good idea, especially with your, you know, your focus on politics and so forth, and your music and your writing, um, to to pick your mind about a few a few things. Um, and before I un unroll those, um, for our audience, uh, can you um, make a distinction that um, regrettably is very rarely made? Um, in, in uh, discourse and in uh, what passes for the media. And that is the difference between, um, we'll say, liberalism and the left. Oh, well, sure. I mean, often used interchangeably. Um, can you define, uh, coming, I think, from an anarchist position and so forth, if that's correct, um, the difference between the left and the liberals? Sure. I mean, and, and of course, these kinds of distinctions. Are uh, it will vary a lot depending on who's talking. So that means they they're they're a lot less useful, perhaps these terms than than they would be otherwise, because people are constantly using different terms, you know, and understanding them differently. But certainly in the mainstream discourse, uh, like on, you know, somewhere like CNN, you know, they'll talk about uh, left left and right in relation to um, the, the Democrats and the Republicans. And, um, you know, so, but then from a, uh, where, where the left, what they mean by left is, is, uh, is a uh, term that is contained within the Democratic Party. And the Democratic Party may have, uh, you know, the more left elements like AOC and Sanders and the more, uh, you know, cons in a more moderate, as they call it, there's no such thing as a conservative Democrat in their, in their worldview, but the more moderate Democrats, which is like the, the ones who owned the coal industry of West Virginia, like Manchin, uh, who they never describe as a coal operator, uh, but only as a moderate Democrat. But uh, and and then you have the um, the Republicans who are generally acknowledged to be to the right of liberal, you know, for whatever reason, however these things are defined. Uh, but when uh, people on the who consider themselves on the left. Uh, use the term left and liberal, then they're differentiating um, the sort of a corporate democratic um, politics um, from authentic uh, what they would, what we perhaps to use, uh, if, if I include myself in this group, um, would uh, would talk about as an anti-capitalist, anti-imperialist politics. And if, if uh, basically, I think, very loosely defined um, for for the left of liberal left, uh, which the left, which is left of the liberals would consider to be the left, uh, as opposed to liberals which are not on the left, uh, the authentic left, as we might dangerously use the term, would include people that are opposed to the excesses of both capitalism and empire and it, and i think you know that's that's in my view or traditionally perhaps if that weird term can be used again a very problematic term uh i think if you know being on the left you need to be against uh capitalism not not necessarily you know opposed to all forms of market economics but you know you need to have a, a serious anti-capitalist analysis and uh, you need to be against um, wars of empire. And, and those would be some very basic um, uh, qu qualifications to, to, to differentiate you as, as a leftist from a liberal. Uh, liberals, uh, from the left perspective, would be uh, people who have uh, inclinations towards the left, inclinations towards things like equality, peace, uh, but, um, but it, when push comes to shove, they support the billionaires and the wars for empire, which is what liberals in power have a long history of doing. I mean, just, you know, to make a, his, an historically accurate observation, you know, which is not to say that the liberals that support these 
corporate imperialist liberal authoritarian leaders uh you know they're the people that vote them into power don't necessarily support their policies you know oftentimes the liberals in the general population who are voting for someone who is running as a liberal are voting for them because they actually are opposed to the excesses of capitalism and empire you know and then they end up voting for somebody like Woodrow Wilson, who the you know, first thing he does after running a campaign against empire, you know, is join the U.S. Is, you know into World War One. I. I mean, that's just one of many typical examples of what supposedly liberal uh, politicians do when they actually have power. But I guess you know we can we can get into all sorts of other words that are very problematic in terms of their definitions, like anarchist, socialist, libertarian. Um, but um, but it, my, that, that's my best little stab at the left liberal divide <laughs> in opinion and a good stab at it a good <laughs> stab it is well you'll you'll given your line of work david you'll of course be familiar with phil oaks um and uh mm. anyone who's interested in an artistic treatment of this um this schism so to speak i uh, can of course listen to love me i'm a liberal um oh, which is a uh, very tongue-in-cheek uh piece which with a number of updates over the years um depending on the administrations and the froth of politics yeah some very good updates ryan harvey's is one of my favorites great so um from with that great explanation david um a few things and it's great to pick your mind here because i don't right rightly know where i fit on <laughs> on the on the board of things but um i certainly in terms of sheer volume tend to hear um you know material from from another aspect of the political jungle um although like i say i don't quite know where where i fit on things so it is good to hear someone who's who's very anchored um in in a historical um left tradition and and to kind of i want to hear your thoughts on some of this because i i can hear but i can only speculate um in other quarters what what the interpretation is so uh it looks like my camera has frozen has my camera hmm. frozen yeah but i can still hear you i'm not sure what's up with the camera freezing <laughs> let me tell you buy the let me switch it here just uh let me tell you, you buy these these here's your capitalism you buy these fancy machines and they they always i thought it was my slow connection with my new fancy connection that isn't fancy at all but yeah oh well, here there's, we go there's I'm several moving. different services that provide broadband in portland they all suck i've used all of them that's right. They can give it zero stars to the whole bunch, right? Yeah. So um, the first thing on, on the chopping block here, from you know, from a from a consistent leftist point of view, looking at the um the pandemic, um how how is that interpreted on the left? Um in the right or the populist conservative world, it was the whole the whole pandemic was seen. Uh, and, and I'm talking about the state's response to it in particular, more than more than the health claims or whatnot, the, 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 bureaucrat, the bureaucracy's response. It was interpreted in other quarters as a giant um, of, of, of a lot of state overreach in, in a different ways. And um, how, how would that be interpreted? How was that time period and, and the state's response um, seen on the left? I think it's a it's a very interesting question because um, because it really uh, sort of uh, highlights uh, the uh, differences on the left between uh, what might be called the authoritarian left and the libertarian left, or uh, you know that's 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 how it might be called from a more libertarian perspective. But you know the uh, the authoritarian left would would use nicer terms to describe themselves. Um, but, um, you know, it definitely um, highlighted the both the effectiveness of government in responding to a crisis or the potential effectiveness of, of the, and the usefulness of the existence of governments in the public health sector and national health services. And, uh, you know, it, it highlighted in some cases how, how uh, useful and important uh, these kinds of collective uh, so social endeavors like governments and public health departments uh, can be, and it also uh, highlighted how uh, 
how incompetent they can be, particularly in the uh, less socialistic and more uh, market-oriented economies like the United States and the United Kingdom, and which did very, very, very badly with the pandemic, as opposed to um, countries with a far higher degree of of um, social organization and uh, left oriented uh, governments that that have been in power for a very long time in places like say Denmark you know which which did a much better job with the pandemic or Cuba for that matter or Vietnam for that matter but um yeah it was um and at the same time as the differences in different sorts of governments and how they're organized um, were, were so well highlighted by the pandemic in terms of, you know, some of them working so well and some of them working so badly, uh, then um, it also highlighted the effectiveness or ineffectiveness of authoritarian responses to crises as well. And also the, the backlash of authoritarian responses to crises, which has been absolutely uh, tremendous and uh, hugely problematic. And um, I think, uh, you know, there's a, there's a big um, cost uh, socially to um, doing things like locking down society. You know, I mean, whether it's the right thing to do on a medical uh, basis in the first place is one question, but then uh, what are the... Uh, what are the costs uh, to to uh, society in so many other ways? I think it's um, unknown at this point, but we we have some ideas, and it's not looking very good in terms of uh, the way that uh, the the way the right has been able to use all of what's been going on over the past couple of years, particularly with government's efforts at responding to the pandemic. And the right has been able to use all that uh, in many ways to their advantage, uh, which is, you know, maybe surprising to a lot of people on, on the left who are, uh, who, who want to just be uh, looking at the bright side of, of how um, public health sectors um, can respond to crises and, and, uh, and in many cases uh, probably uh, save a lot of lives compared to what would have happened without any of these measures happen, you know, taking place uh, for sure. But, um, uh, you know, this isn't how the right wingers are, are looking at or their, their, you know, their base of support are looking at the whole thing. And, and it's also not how a lot of other folks are looking at it. You don't have to be, it's not necessarily a right left thing. I mean, it's, uh, uh, there's a lot of people who, who might identify with either right or left thinking in, in when it comes to, uh, things like capitalism and empire, um, and even various aspects of identity, uh, you know, politics who, don't necessarily uh, have the same kind of view when it comes to government um, overreach or, or or what can be seen as uh, authoritarian responses to a crisis. You know, there's a lot of people in the world who are much more sympathetic with the Swedish uh, method of dealing with the pandemic than they are with the Chinese method, you know, uh, there's, it's not, it's not just the right wingers who, who think Sweden did a better job than China, despite the death toll, you know, the, I mean, and it's not like universally th that left wingers think that either, but I think it's, it's very, it's very divided. And, and I think you would find for certainly more anarchists are, are uh, on the Swedish side of the equation than the Chinese side, uh, as far as uh, how to deal with pandemics um you know which is not to say that that's even a universal thing but but the uh, uh the notion of people having uh human rights uh, that shouldn't just be um ignored in the favor of uh preventing a uh, virus from spreading uh you know through the most uh, uh, what might seem like the most effective means i mean it's um Sweden's death toll wasn't necessarily that much lower than some of the other countries that took far more draconian measures. Although, of course, it was uh, they had far higher death toll than somewhere like China, but uh, not necessarily a far higher death toll than somewhere like Italy or the United Kingdom, which also took a lot of draconian measures that Sweden never took. You know, so it's um, it's it's 
it's very complex in all sorts of ways and and the pandemic um highlighted so many of these kinds of complexities and and you know differences in trying to in in analyzing society and and, the, and how you deal with crises and, and what are the consequences of different ways of dealing with crises it's all been very much uh living room conversation i think for for a lot of people in in ways that it, that normally sort of machiavellian politics are more something that you only only some people think about perhaps but i think a lot of people have been forced to think about this stuff that might not normally and using that great expression, David, uh, Machiavellian politics, that's a good way to introduce um, this, uh, well, to see if this, uh, if this concept exists um, on the left, because, and then I want to probe um, a little bit more about, about the pandemic. Um, in your reading and your discussions, is there, um, on, on elements of what's called the dissident right, um, which it tends to be more philosophically consistent than the froth of, um, of you know, just uh, some of these commenters online, there's this concept um, called the cathedral, um, and it's it's uh, was written by um, an author by the name of Curtis Yarvin, and he sees this in society as this type of confederacy between civil power, the media, and academia, this type of blob, this Borg of power in society, and so. Uh, it adds a third dimension to the left, the right, um, separate than either of those, the liberals, conservatives, but there's this, this Borg of power that will shift every couple of generations. And I'm impressed um, over just thinking the past couple of decades, you know, go back 20 years, you had this type of neoconservative war um, vampire clique. And the response to that was um, something you're familiar with, Occupy Wall Street. And then on the right, uh, so to speak, you had the, the Tea Party, which was very much um, of, of a similar, maybe more baby boomer <laughs> mindset, but they had very similar uh, gripes. Now, um, as I, you know, at least as it presents itself, the cathedral is, um, is superficially liberal and the opposition, these populist oppositions tend to, in their rhetoric and stuff, be on the right. And yet they're basically, as I see it, um, the same sorts of dynamics in the power structure and the opposition, the same sorts of people that were in the White House 20 years ago or 30 years ago are the same sorts that are there now. They've just changed their clothes, so to speak. The yeah. same sorts of people that were Occupy are at MAGA rallies now yeah, um, or Yellow Vests or whatever. Um, yeah. So before I probe here, um, how does that idea of the cathedral play into, into leftist analyses? <clears throat> I'm not familiar with the right winger you're talking about or the cathedral concept, but I'm very familiar with um, the the rest of what you're talking about. Um, I mean, I think well, basically, I would I would when we're when we're talking about this these kinds of questions with left and right, um, then uh, you know, f first of all, I wouldn't want to be the person um, explaining the left position because I have no idea what it is. Because um, the left uh, position, uh, as with the right positions, as with many other positions, are constantly changing. And um, there's, there's nothing consistent. I would love to say otherwise, but it's not true. There's nothing consistent about left-wing thinking any more, there's anything, any more than there's anything consistent about right-wing thinking. Um, you know, the, the contemporary left in the United States... Um, I'm not sure what it is, but um, you know, I, I don't, I don't know if if uh, identitarianism is a left wing phenomenon or a right wing phenomenon. I don't think it's either necessarily. It's just a, um, it's a phenomenon that is uh, disconnected from uh, economics, or uh, or or any kind of uh, class analysis, uh, and and fundamental to traditional, like left wing thinking, like from the 1840s to you know, prior to the 1840s, but since the since the term has existed, since the left-right term has existed, which as far as I know, is it goes back to the 1840s. I don't know how much further it goes, but in any case, like certainly since the Industrial Revolution, since we've been talking about class and left and right and, you know, this kind of stuff, to be a left-winger has been, uh, you. It, it means to be to be very critical of capitalism and also to understand that the working class is your main 
interest and the owning class are going to be using the are going to be using their powers at every given opportunity to divide and conquer the working class. So that's why they have wars of empire. And that's why uh, traditionally the left has always opposed wars of empire, because we have always seen that this is a tool of, emp of the empire to divide and conquer the, the working class, just as racism and sexism and many other isms, uh, in, you know, na nationalism, uh, xenophobia, uh, have been traditionally used very effectively by the ruling class to keep the working class divided. And so we have traditionally seen um, the use of xenophobia and racism uh, to divide and conquer the, the working class as, as a, you know, as problems to be overcome uh, largely because of understanding the obvious good in a united working class because when you look at the way society is divided and who owns everything which is namely the rich in this country and so much most of the rest of the world you know then it's obvious that when you live in a i mean especially was obvious in in the more agricultural periods what that of course, you know, who owns the land, that, that's who has everything. I mean, the land is everything. The land was everything. And uh, so, you know, whether you had land to farm was everything. And so that was a very simple thing. It wasn't about uh, overcoming internal biases and it wasn't about, uh, y you know, um, any of this identitarian nonsense. It was about who owned what and, and who owns what and, and who deserves to own what. You know, and uh, how everything is distributed. That's what it's all about. That's that's what the whole left-right divide, and that's what the class war, and that's what the divide between those who own and those who starve. That's uh, that's what it was all about for centuries. And now it's uh, now you know it's very it's much more complicated, and and it's been more complicated for a long time. It's been the case uh, ever since there have been fascists. It's been the case that these fascists, you know, that fascists, fascists, fascism is a political phenomenon that grew out of. It was a response to socialism, right? It wouldn't exist otherwise. National socialism is a, or wants to be seen as a form of socialism, but it's of course it's not. It's it's just a um, another way that the ruling class has found it found it to be very effective to divide the working class by adopting all kinds of uh, socialist ideals, which are hugely popular and have been very, you know, popular ever since uh, Karl Marx uh, was, you know, <laughs> wrote anything, you know, and before Karl Marx as well. But, um, you know, they, the, now um, you got um, more and more of the, of what had been the, um, clearly pro-capitalist and pro-empire Republican Party uh, being increasingly swayed by national socialist kind of rhetoric, which is, you know, as represented very eloquently in every sense of the word by Donald Trump, um, who is a national socialist in the traditional sense of the word. Um, you know, in, in that he's, you know, full of all these contradictions. He's not really any kind of a socialist. None of the national socialists are socialists. And Trump is consistently not socialist in that sense, too, you know, but he uses the rhetoric of national socialism uh, unmistakably without veiling it. You know, you don't need to. I mean, of course, hardly anybody's read Hitler. So, you know, <laughs> people don't realize that he's just quoting Mein Kampf half the time, you know or, you know, variations, paraphrasing Mein Kampf. But um, yeah, I mean, this is now um, a, a big mainstream part of the Republican Party is this, this is a this is national socialist kind of strain and um, sort of authoritarian, um, uh, identitarian politics that are completely removed from any kind of class analysis is now becoming the dominant um, political uh whatever philosophy or whatever you could call it um coming out of the democratic party it's it's um it's completely bankrupt um 
as a you know sort of a, a tool of united the uniting the working class anymore it makes no serious pretense about that it's just all about um you know some some kind of vague ideas of overcoming all kinds of various forms of discrimination as if we're going to solve the housing crisis by you know by housing little groups of discriminated against people here and there and then some, some somehow magically that's going to solve the problem i mean it's just like Wizard of Oz kind of thinking. I mean, it just makes no sense whatsoever to anybody with a brain. If you actually look at the economics of the situation, we're not talking about a few marginalized people that need to be unmarginalized so that we can uh, have, uh, you know, housing the, of the working class in this country. We're talking about a, a massive, massive problem that is far beyond any of those tokenistic solutions. It's far beyond anything that any municipality can possibly even dream of solving. It's such a massive national problem and and the and and they just talk about these things like uh you know just completely disconnected from reality as if they're trying to recruit for a fascist movement that doesn't yet really exist but you know if it did exist it would be it, it would it would spread like a wildfire it would spread faster than these fires are spreading because i think basically neither the republicans or the democrats are are actually appealing to most people and and I think this country is is ripe for uh, an actual an actual fascist leader to 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 come into the situation. You know, if there were a fascist leader like Donald Trump, but one who actually was like had was more intelligent and and more eloquent. I mean, I'm not saying that Trump is dumb or 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 inept with words but you know he's got a lot of skills in those regards but he's got a lot of serious limitations he's a, he's a he's a he's a really unreconstructed narcissist i mean he's got he's got serious problems you know and and i think that, you know they could the the rule the, the, they need a, a better um fascist leader if they if they you know if they want to uh take advantage of the tinder box that has been created by the Democratic Party's complete lack of leadership over the past 50 years. That's a great expression, unreconstructed narcissist. <laughs> You're gonna have to remember that one there. And you know, it's interesting when you speak of these, these, um, you know, the, the, the uselessness sometimes of these designations. I'm preparing a uh, presentation on um, English language folk music from the Napoleonic Wars. And mm. What's very interesting is on a lot of fronts, the, the English working class uh, that was backing Napoleon had elements, um, Napoleon, you know, representing maybe a kind of a refined uh, French Revolution, had a, a number of elements to him that were very much opposed to the English working class, and yet they saw in him um, a hero because of his his opposition to certain banking uh, things and all sorts of things. But it is interesting, and, and our... Um, our, our um, curious political contradictions in the factions is nothing new. No, no. Right. Um, having set up, David, this idea of the cathedral, this power borg or, or whatnot, um, and if you want to run with it or, or, or tear it down, um, getting back to the, the pandemic response on, you know, my little, I don't know, I don't, I don't uh, put my address there, so to speak, by, as I've said before, but I'm certainly aware of, the, of that discourse. Um, there was a, a, um, an interpretation of the, rea the response to COVID that saw it only superficially as a health response, but actually it was a, a power grab and also a financial grab. And it seems that a lot of people made a lot of money um, off of off of um, these disruptions. I, I forget how many billionaires were made in the pandemic. And you mentioned the ownership of land um, in the in this disruption uh, economically. Um, two other things in this analysis was this idea of um, of the UBI or the universal basic income being basically floated and, and popularized. And then also, um, is it 
BlackRock, I forget the the uh, real mm-hmm. estate company, but they are vac in this country, America here, that we're we're on top of. They're just vacuuming up properties left and right, creating a, a basically a feudal society where we're all just renters. So um, I think very inaccurately, the populist sorts who tend tend to the right, they very inaccurately looked at the cathedral, if in fact it exists. They looked at the power board. They saw that it was superficially left wing. Uh, because Dunkin' Donuts is whatever, you know, rainbow flags in June on their on their merch. So therefore, mm-hmm. all the pa- they must all be leftists. Um, but anyway, uh, how does how does that um, int- the idea of the power grab underneath the the pandemic? How has that been um, analyzed, if at all, um, on the left or in your neck of the woods, <laughs> or however you would like to you know phrase it? I mean, I think. Um... I think it's becoming more and more clear to a lot of people, um, you know, whether they'd be defined as on the left or the right. And again, I'm not sure what the left or the right is these days. So I don't know where I am on that. You know, I, 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 uh, you know, I call myself a libertarian socialist and, and I don't, I don't generally use the term left to describe myself because it's too vague, but libertarian socialist being a combination of two words is you know, you could put two words together, and and you you then you're getting somewhere in terms of creating a definition, right? Um, any by themselves, none of these words are enough to give anybody any idea of what we're talking about. Right, left, anarchist, socialist, libertarian, and none of them are, are are words that make any sense to me anymore, or if they ever did. Um, you know, because uh, you can't, you have to differentiate between, like, for example, the authoritarian left and the socialist left, or the, uh, you know, the the, uh, the libertarian left and the authoritarian left, or the or the um, or, or the uh, neoconservative right and the populist uh, sort of uh, national socialist right. You know, um, however we define these terms, but you know, they are just uh, you know. Then we get at uh, some we get some idea of who we're talking about. You know, are we talking about Rand Paul or are we talking about George Bush or Donald Trump? They they all represent very different um, you know understandings of of what we might call the right. But um, but I you know one thing that's clear I think to to people from any political persuasion if they are actually paying any attention to reality is that. Uh, these the big tech uh, big tech has just made so much money and out of uh, the pandemic and uh, and they've been doing this for decades and um, I think more and more people are understanding that this is the, the new um, ruling class um, that these are not uh, you know smart little boy geniuses or whatever that are out to make the world a better place. They are uh, capitalists, just like capitalists have always been. They are out to take advantage of a disruptive situation of uh, technological change in order to uh, and and of uh, you know owning uh, the government of their law power as lobbyists of uh, Supreme Court decisions, all sorts of things that they are able to take advantage of to uh, turn the, the new reality um, to their uh, great advantage. And, um, you know, just as they were able to sort of weaponize the Homestead Act and turn that into a, uh, a, a great uh, advantage for, um, uh, for the ruling class uh, and make them, which made them richer than they ever had been before. I mean, it's, it's worth maybe mentioning that, you know, the Homestead Act uh, of, 19, of 1862 was, um, according to some analyses of history, a direct um, response to the farmers' rebellions that had preceded it in, in upstate New York um, just prior to that period in the 1840s. And it, there was uh, the, the sort of expansion, westward expansion of the United States was going on. And, uh, you know, the colonial, settler colonial project was <clears throat> in full, you know, full bloom, <laughs> whatever you want to call it. Uh, wars going on with Mexico, you know, the the expansion of the country was 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 happening, uh, and um, and and of course in the modern sort of uh, left perspective, uh, you know, we we look at the, mostly the negative aspects of that, uh, such as uh, the fact that this was, uh, you know, the Homestead Act pretty much exclusively benefited white settlers and not, you know, other settlers, you know. 
uh, who often weren't even own, allowed to own land in places like Oregon, you know. Uh, so, of course, it was a racist act. It was a racist society, et cetera, et cetera. But, it, it, but when we understand also that it was um, an effort to um, avoid ex the expansion of what was a feudal, economically feudal reality on the East Coast and, and avoid expanding that uh, to the rest of the country, but to have a different model involving land grants for universities and uh, and land grants for uh, white male settlers who um, who who could then get land for free uh, and farm it rather than um, you know buying it or renting it from feudal landlords um, but then of course as we know what happened next was the robber barons uh, and the rich uh, you know as, as they were called back then uh, you know got it you know started buying up all the land that people couldn't manage to make money on farming or whatever whatever was going on with different people take advantage of, of their people being out of luck or alcoholic or you know, any, any number of other situations, buying and buying and buying all this land that all these people had gotten for free. And pretty much before you know it, you know, you got feudalism again, you know, basically with the, with the, with the rich owning so much uh, of the country, you know, despite the Homestead Act. And, you know, the internet was a new homestead act you know in a way you know really and um and and the internet without without it being a law of course but you know it was a law in some ways it, it bill clinton's attitude towards the internet of just let it letting it be you know was kind of a very homestead act ish uh, response you know to you know to the situation and you know had a lot of um mixed um a aspects to it but in any case the, the internet, which I think, like the Homestead Act, was largely positive at the beginning, um, you know, with all those other qualifications, you know, but basically the, the basic the, the basic aspect of it was there was an egalitarian thrust to it at the beginning. And then uh, big tech, you know, the, the billionaires, um, you know, figured out, uh, you know, certain billionaires, not necessarily the same sets of, of billionaires as said, you know, made all the money off of the, you know, the, the uh, Homestead Act. But um, in some cases, you know, the, the same families, but, you know, other cases, new ones. But in any case, uh, the billionaires figured out how to uh, take advantage of this new frontier. Uh, and um, and turn it into uh, something that has made them the richest class ever to walk this earth, which is exactly what John D. Rockefeller and his mates were 120 years ago. Yeah, and unfortunately, um, something you've brought up a few times in, in this hour together, David, has been you know this this class consciousness and that's um where we're i think in the rub we the we the people as, as they say um the, the the class consciousness which could uh produce a trust buster like roosevelt or could produce you know some some even anemic ways to rein this in that class consciousness is completely uh, completely evaporated. It hasn't evaporated. It's been. It's had the legs kicked out from under it every time it tries to, <laughs> to assert itself. But that's the real uh, difficulty here. Is um, one of the reasons we're so trapped in this left-right jibber jabber is um, is because we're we're lacking any other dimensions that we're just mentally that we're even allowed to, by the media to consider things through. I. It is so. It is so insidious um that reality that we are not allowed to talk about class we're not allowed to talk about labor history we're not allowed to even know anything about labor history for the most part most of us you know but then of course if we were to know anything about it we're certainly not allowed to get on tv or get on the radio and talk about what we know and talk about the history and, and share this uh, information with people so the um what people end up with is a completely utterly distorted uh, understanding of the world around them currently and historically. And, and this is propagated by uh, what we could call the progressive industrial complex, which is, um, which is 
I think, um, which bears defining a little bit. Like, what is what is that? You know, I would say it's um, because I, you know, because the term that I and I only just and I, I didn't invent this term, but I apparently I I thought I might have, but I, then I looked it up and found you know somebody else. I'm I'm not going to mention who used it before, but uh, but the progressive industrial complex. People talked about the nonprofit industrial complex, and and that's um, a relevant under a, a very relevant term, uh, which is you know very important to to, to understand, and 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 I would I think the progressive industrial complex is just like a little more accurate understanding of what we're talking about here, but the nonprofit industrial complex, I mean when 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 people talk about that, just you know broadly, you know not necessarily specifically, but in terms of the un basic understanding of what we're talking about there and is what we're talking about is certain things get funded and certain things don't. And that's true in the media, it's true in academia, it's true among any group organization that does grants. In, in fact, it's true in science as well. It's true in medicine, it's true in so many different things that we, you know, where we think things are objective and, and things get funded in some kind of mysterious way. It, it's not objective, it's very subjective, and what gets funded is, is very, very political. And that's true with scientific research. Um, you know, of course, uh, the diseases that get researched are the diseases that affect rich people most, mostly, you know, not the ones that, you know, not malaria, which mainly affects people in, in poor countries, you know? Uh, so, it, it, but then with the, the nonprofit industrial complex, if you do, an analysis as you know some people have done you know you see what what does get funded what gets on pbs what gets on npr what uh what gets written about in, in academia overwhelmingly it's okay or it's encouraged uh to i mean you can hear it constantly on npr and pbs going back decades it's uh and you know, you can talk about race, and you can talk about gender, and you can talk about sexuality. And in fact, you should do those things every day. I agree. And but NPR thinks so uh, very much. But where me and NPR differ is, <laughs> is you should also be able to talk about class, which plays into race and gender, so intimately and sexuality, that it's it, it, the only way you can disentangle class from those things is basically by being a corporation that's not funding the right stuff because you know you're telling your that what the what the nonprofit industrial complex is essentially telling their journalists their academics all the people applying for grants all the people looking for funding the artists you know what they're telling them and and you know, for people who apply for grants, this is something everybody knows already, you know, but what they're telling them is you have to focus your attention and your research and your music and your documentaries and your movies and whatever you were trying to do. If you're trying to get funding, it better be about race, gender, or sexuality, or else you're not going to get the funding. So what does that end up meaning? You know, it means that we all get to hear about uh, some of the most, it, it, it means we, we just get a, a extremely distorted idea of, of reality. And, and just to take 1921 as one example of, uh, because it was just the 100th anniversary of 1921, right? Last year. And so we were hearing about <laughs> certain events that happened in 1921. And I think it would be fair to say that a majority of people in the United States are now aware of the existence of a place in Tulsa, Oklahoma called Black Wall Street. They're aware of that there was a racist pogrom uh, directed at the people of that neighborhood, the Greenwood neighborhood of Tulsa, Oklahoma in 1921 that resulted in hundreds of people being killed, thousands displaced, a whole neighborhood being r r ransacked and burned to the ground. And everybody should know about that. Of course, they should also know about the historical context in which that happened, which 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 is much more 
complex, which requires more education. I mean, it'd be nice if everybody knew that too. But I, you know, I don't want to get you know too uh, aspirational here about what everybody should know. But certainly, they should know about the Greenwood pogrom of 1921. But they should also know that just two months after that, a uh, few hundred miles to the east of Oklahoma in the state of West Virginia, there was a multi-racial multi armed uprising, 13,000 white and 2,000 black miners who fought for three days and nights under the banner of their union to uh, try to free other union miners from uh, a, a jail in which they were being held in, indefinitely in the town of Mingo, West Virginia. And, um, you know, and this was the first use of the Air Force uh, to drop bombs on people within the bounds of the United States. Tulsa was also uh, one of the first uses of planes to drop explosives on people. It was not the Air Force in that particular case. In West Virginia, it was the actual Air Force. So that's worth worth noting, worth noting for a lot of reasons. Biggest armed uprising in the history of the United States. Biggest multiracial armed uprising in the history of the United States. First use of the Air Force to drop bombs on people in the United States. There's a lot of things about the Battle of Blair Mountain and the coal mine wars in 1920-21 in West Virginia generally that are very, very worth knowing about. But you'll hear, you'll have heard hardly anything about uh, the Battle of Blair Mountain. It was mentioned a couple times, but it's it's nothing like the scale of uh, Greenwood, the Greenwood pogrom, you know. And this is um, representative of the kind of education that we're getting from the progressive industrial complex or from the nonprofit industrial complex anyway. And when I talk about the progressive industrial complex rather than the nonprofit industrial complex, I'm just extending the concept because I think what's so important for everybody to understand is that the, the, the themes that are sort of set by the nonprofit industrial complex are then adopted by the broader progressive community, uh, which amplifies these messages in a massive way through everybody's, you know, interviews and blogs and YouTube channels and all the other things that regular people are doing all the time online you know we're amplifying uh, that that all that messaging and all the and, and we're amplifying you know all the messages that say what's acceptable to talk about and what's not and and what's um what's somehow provocative to talk about you know uh it's uh, and of course as you as you you know may be well aware you know be, being a white guy talking about class um you're 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 provoking um you're being provocative not that you're provoking, um, uh, not that I've ever uh, been, not that I ever seem to, as far as I'm aware, be actually provoking um, anybody from any of the marginalized groups that should supposedly be, be provoked by me talking about class. But I sure provoke a lot of other white guys who, um, who think that they're representing marginalized groups because, you know, they have some aspect of their... Um, uh, background that they believe uh, makes them somehow marginalized, uh, whether it's real or not. I mean, you know, everybody has to be marginalized these days. Nobody wants to be a white guy anymore. You know, I mean, not that I think being a white guy should be a specially popular thing. You know, it's just a lot of us are born that way. And it's just, uh, you know, it's a very normal thing to be. <laughs> To, to be a white guy in this world today. You know, it's a very normal thing to be a black guy, black woman, brown, whatever, you know, these are all very normal. White's very normal too. There's like half a billion of us or more. Well said, well said. It's um, a lot, I think the class analysis is something a lot of us could do with, uh, you know, I think it would, it would only enhance um, wherever we're coming from with things. And um, it's been a while since I, I've heard of the Mingo Wars. There was a good movie from the 70s, I think, that, that they uh, put out. Um, but uh, excellent. Well, David, as we, as we wind things down here, where can we find out about your, uh, your work, your writing and your music and tell us about your tours that are coming up, especially if you have any um, imminent I am, uh, people can go to davidrovics.com and find out about all that stuff. That's where I have the sort of all the links and all the general lowdown on everything. But 
I'll be touring Scandinavia in October and hopefully recording an album with some other musicians in Hawaii in January, uh, depending on how the crowdfunding goes for that project. And I'll be touring the UK in June. And otherwise, I'll be here in Portland, Oregon, um, trying to get into trouble locally. Well, there's a lot worse places to be in January than uh, Hawaii. So there you go. <laughs> that's great. I know. That's that's probably the least useful thing about trying to crowdfund for a recording project in Hawaii <laughs> in January is that everybody, the first thing they think is, oh, you're just trying to have a vacation, which, of course, I'm, I'm sure I'll enjoy being in Hawaii in January, but actually that has nothing to do with it. it there's, a, there's a recording studio, a guy named Chet has a, a wonderful recording studio. He's a brilliant multi-instrumentalist and sound engineer and producer who has offered to host me and other musicians to make an album, but he lives in Hawaii, so we got to get there, which actually for Portland, for me, is not a big deal. It's uh, actually a fairly inexpensive uh, flight from, from Portland to Hawaii, but this is not the case for uh, the musician from Glasgow. I'm trying to get over there. <laughs> right. Well, it'll work out for sure. So I look forward to seeing the fruit of that down the line. So uh, to the audience, thank you for your attention here and do check out David's website if anyone's interested in college and high school uh, classes and indeed integrated courses, please consider apocastostasisinstitute.wordpress.com. Uh, that'll, that'll get the ball rolling on, on uh, my work over here. And David, especially, thank you so much for your insights into politics, into art, into the hour that we're at right now. Thank you so much, John. It's been a great pleasure talking to you. Thanks for doing all you do. And you know that if your institute, everybody is, if they just can spell it, then it's sort of a, um, it's sort of a, that's the first test, you know, that tells them, uh, tells you that, you, you know, you might want to take some courses here if you can, if you can get to the actual website. <laughs> you know, that's, that's right. Great. You get that. If you can do that, you get that dopamine burst and you're, right. you're, you're right in the door there. You're on the, the on the skids to, uh, to enrolling. So <laughs> very good, David. Good, good counsel there. All right, everyone take care now.